Getting a business off the ground requires data-driven strategy and truly exceptional product. But entrepreneurs know there is a lot more to building a business than analytics and sleep design. We want to know what makes founders tick, how they pivot to tackle the hard stuff, what keeps them up all night, and what keeps them going each day. I'm Jenny Rudin. And I'm Katie Demo, And we're the co-founders of Brass Clothing and your hosts for Making It Happen, a show where we have raw, honest conversations with other founders like ourselves. Join us for fly-on-the-wall access to intimate discussions about what it's really like to start, run, and grow a business. This is Making It Happen. Being a founder is all about taking You may be risking your financial stability, your relationships, or your career, but there's certainly no way you can start a business without taking risks. Today, we're joined by Chelsea Moore, the CEO and co-founder of BoxBox. BoxBox began in 2014 with a clear mission to bring gift boxes into the 21st century. In this episode of Making It Happen, we learn about how Chelsea left her first job right out of college to found BoxBox and how she's taken measured risks over the past seven years to build her company into what it is today. Welcome, Chelsea. Welcome, Chelsea. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Chelsea, we love to start each episode by setting the stage and hearing a little bit about what led you up to starting your business. So if you wouldn't mind giving us a little bit of background, that would be amazing. Yeah. So BoxBox started in 2014. Um, I was... Uh, a year out of school when we officially launched. Um, But really, it was the winter beforehand that my friends and I, we just felt very disconnected from each other. You know, we had, you go to college, you have just the most amazing community in the world. And then after graduation, all my friends, like many people around the country, split up, went to business school, went to law school, started their amazing jobs. I stayed in Los Angeles with my co-founder and college friend, Jenny Olivero. And we just felt like it was really hard to tangibly be there for others in these big life moments Mm -hmm. when you couldn't physically actually be there. Um, And we felt like upon exploration for like engagement celebrations or sympathy type gifts or care packages that there was just definitely room for a better way to do it. So the original thought was, oh, I wonder if it would be like, there's some sort of plug-in where I can pull my favorite stuff from Nordstrom or Anthropology or my favorite boutique. But that kind of evolved into like, oh, we could actually be the ones that kit it to an aesthetic and standard and let it be hyper-personalized and store or stock all of the best brands in one place. And so build a box box was really at the root of everything. Yeah. Um, and we started working on it in like January of 2014 and we're like slowly working on it through the year. And then I was working at an ad agency and I hated it. And then in June I was like, peace out ad agency. I am going to hustle on the side and, you know, work with Jenny and we have another co-founder Sabina. Um, and we just were like, we're going to launch by Christmas. And so we started with ready to ship gift boxes because that was just a little bit easier and we needed some time to build the build a box box platform. So we launched that November. It was like to us, so busy, so crazy, so successful. Looking back, it was three of us in an apartment. It wasn't that wild, but like it was, um, and you know, the following June we launched build a box box and it's just been crazy ever since. Sometimes I think when you're super young and naive, you're, you're so just like oblivious to the potential ramifications of that major risk, like leaving the professional workforce, no resume really under your belt and starting your own business. Like sometimes that's a blessing and a curse. Could you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah. So I started at the ad agency. I was grateful for the opportunity. I met some wonderful people. That's how I met Sabina, one of our co-founders. Okay. Um, I went to college with Jenny, worked with Sabina, but, um, Really, I just was like, there was one night I was like on the new business team and I'm like sitting in this print production room at like 3 a.m. waiting for a creative to like put his final blessing on something so that I could then hand it to a courier who was going to get on a flight at 5 a.m. out of LAX. And I'm just like, I'm doing this for like a mattress brand. What am I doing here? This is not going to be my life. And so (laughs) that was also like the sentiments that were happening at the same time. But I do think the audacity was there. And I mean, don't get me wrong. 
Jenny and Sabina, it took them over a year to quit their full-time jobs. Okay. You know, they were working at night. They were working really hard in their own schedule. But I was also, me and Jenny, we like bought a spray tan machine. We were tanning sorority girls all throughout LA to pay our rent. I was still working for the retail company, Brandy Melville. I was hosting their warehouse sales and Mm -hmm. I was nannying one of the owner's daughter like twice a week and helping her with math homework. Like we were very busy. I was still like reeling in the post-grad babysitting market because you could still kind of get away with it before they're like, wait, you're too old. Mm -hmm. Um, It's too expensive. But, you know, I felt like, A, we couldn't fail. I literally just thought we were like, this is a great idea. This, And, you know, we've since inspired quite a bit of copycats, but we were kind of the first to do this build a box box platform and Mm -hmm. that customization and personalization. We were just convinced it was going to take off. And honestly, you know, there was a lot of insecurity too, because, you know, we come from a very successful group of friends. We have doctors, we have lawyers, we have consultants, we are, you know, very overachievy. And at the time they were going to these amazing schools and amazing jobs. And, you know, Jenny and I felt a little insecure. You really have to be super vulnerable to want to start something of your own and to kind of be willing to ride that wave for like a year and a half of getting it off the ground. Um, So I feel like it's this weird combination of like cocky audacity that like we can't fail and also like humble vulnerability of like, well, we're not doctors, but we're not curing cancer, but we think this is kind of going to work. So I don't know. It was an interesting time, but I do think that like if I was 30 or if I was 40, it might be, I might have approached it differently. Yeah. Um, but so, I also, we, we also learned so much that like, if I were to launch something else, I would also go about it differently the next yeah, time, you yeah, know, hundred percent. So it sounds like at that time you were at least pretty risk averse. Is that how you would describe yourself? I think I was just a little naive of like, yeah, this isn't gonna fail. That was just my, I, I never once in the last seven years through COVID through supply chain issues, through anything, people quitting, people onboarding, none of that have I ever been like, oh, we're going to fail. Like, it, really? and like, maybe that's cocky or maybe that's just like, I see the North Star. Because, you know, when Jenny and I started this, you know, the the goal for us wasn't to be this like hyper VC backed go public thing. It was like, how do you create not only serve this amazing need that we've decided exists in the world and like really help people maintain their most important personal and professional relationships, but also how do you create this private corporation that is a means for us to live a fulfilled and generous life and to sustain the livelihoods of our employees in a meaningful way. Yeah, That's always, that's been something we said when we were 22 and that's something we say now that we're turning 30. Like I want our employees to be able to buy houses. I still think one of the most Im- amazing moments in our life was like when we were able to do full scale healthcare for everybody like that. Yeah. It's like those boring details, but that's what really mattered to us. No, that makes such a difference. I mean, that's a moment of pride that you'll, you know, that's an incredible service that you're able to 100%. provide employees. Being 22 years old, having never run a business before and getting into inventory and inventory management, how did you look at that? What kind of financial risks did you take personally building up your inventory? Um, and what were the conversations that you and Jenny had while you were like making these decisions? I was really lucky that Brandy Melville, which I worked at throughout the majority of college, was a paid opportunity. And mm-hmm. I had the privilege from my family of not paying for school and not paying for my own housing. And so I was able to save that money. Mm-hmm. Um So we did have a bit of cash to put behind whatever we needed to buy. But, you know, in the beginning, it was so simple. It was like, we need an order of boxes from China of our gift boxes. Mm -hmm. And we need like a small amount of startup inventory. And, you know, we really didn't know what we were doing. I mean, inventory management has been quite the journey even now going into five, six, seven years. But at the time, you know, we weren't taking a paycheck in the beginning. So like we, we were working out of my apartment. Uh, we didn't really have costs outside of those boxes in that inventory. And when we launched on 
November 7th, I mean, we were selling through things to the point where we reordered boxes, you know, pretty quickly for Q1 2015. Mm -hmm. And so it was very slow build, but it was regenerating itself. Um, And, you know, it's not until you get to the point of like year four where, you know, you have to go get your lines of credit because you do need that cash in order to bump it up to the next level. But at Mm -hmm. the time, those first two years weren't that complicated. Like we weren't paying ourselves. We were really just trying to build a brand and work to the point where we could pay the three of ourselves. Um, and then we added, you know, like, um, someone to help in the, in the where in not the warehouse in my apartment and, um, like small things like that. Amazing. What would you, um, what would you identify as some of the biggest risks you've taken along the way as the company's grown over the past seven years, uh, that were scary moments where you sort of felt like you're on a precipice and you're all diving in together. When we were first in my apartment in Venice, Jenny and I kind of identified that we needed to find a three bedroom so that we could have one bedroom be box box and two bedrooms be ourselves because we were kind of annoying all of our other roommates because we had all this like stock in our apartment. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I remember we were like, well, box box will pay the rent for the third room. And that was the scariest financial moment. We were just like, wow, we're really signing away this lease saying that this one room is going to pay. And I remember it was like a thousand a month for this room. It was like not that big of a deal, but it was like, you know, such a huge moment for us where we were super nervous. We then moved into an official warehouse, you know, a year and a half later. I think every time we've signed a retail or a commercial lease, it's been, has been scary because, Uh you know, you're putting your personal credit guarantee on the line. And, and, you know, we now are in 15,000 square feet and, you know, this move in 2018 was one of the scariest things for me because it was a five-year commitment. We have no idea how we're going to grow within those five years, all that sort of thing. But I think along the way to answer your question, like the risks, it was financial in the beginning. I think like for us, you know, we backed it with our own, we started with our own money. I think that we, um, what I know now is that I should have pursued like a small business loan in the beginning Mm -hmm. or a line of credit, but I didn't know that that was something you could do. You know, I just like, was like, oh, we have to back this with our own money and prove this out ourselves. Um, so, you know, I think that's scary. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, when we've started to, and now we have like stellar talent and when you're negotiating and bringing on these more expensive hires, that's always scary. Yeah. Um, you know, because a, you want to do right by them and you want to make sure this is the right place for them, but you know, they are an investment themselves. That's been really risky. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, every time we launch something, it's been risky, but definitely, I mean, the financial stuff, every single time we have like this level up moment in the last seven years, you know, it's scary. You know, we get a big, huge line of credit. I personally, I, you know, we guarantee it. That's, that's a big deal. Um, especially, you know, before COVID and, and stuff like that. I'm actually curious too, in terms of toolkit items. Um, obviously you're, you have two co-founders and I assume you don't always see eye to eye on every decision you make, perhaps particularly when it comes to risk taking. Tell a little bit about how you guys balance each other out and when you are in disagreement over something, how you come together on the right solution, right Mm -hmm. step forward. Yeah, I think, you know, we definitely don't always agree. I think we agree a fair amount, probably more than other founders. I think there's something special about people who knew you when or people who knew you around college mm-hmm. age. It, it kind yeah. of is like a different level of camaraderie that carries into adulthood for sure. I mean, again, it's all about information. We over communicate. Like we are, we talk about that all the time. We com- commit to over communicate, mm-hmm. commu- over communication, but it's really just like hearing people, listening to people, listening to all of our sides and then really coming to a conclusion. I mean, there's times when, you know, we always invoke the like, I have, I'm going to die on this hill or like, this is a non-negotiable. Yeah. And like, but we always like, if someone gets to that point, you know, it's pretty meaningful between the three of us. And so we do listen to that. I mean, the palette for taking on financial risk has definitely broadened over the last few years. I think between the three of us, I was always actually, I think the most risky um, and willing mm-hmm. to take the risk. Um, 
I think other, the other two might have, you know, been a little bit more nervous. I think because we have a lot of the information at hand and we have, you know, pretty trusted advisors and we have our CFO, I think we're all a little bit more, um, like how I was in the beginning. Um, but you know, like new product launches, new hires, like we, we do our best to kind of come to a really great consensus on all of that kind of stuff. And I think it's, I mean, it boils down to truly listening um, and um, valuing each other and respecting each other. Because if you lose the respect, you lose the trust. And then what are you doing? Has there ever been a risk that you guys have taken where you're like, shit, I really regret that decision? Mm, I wouldn't say there's ever anything we've regretted. Mm -hmm. I would say there's things that we thought we should do that we we're like, well, we wouldn't do it again. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, for example, um, our business is not really set up for resale within like a big retailer, but being in a big retailer is such a mark of success for some reason in this country. And for, you know, some CPG brands and some D to C brands that makes sense. You know, you want the clout of that retailer and the history yep. and the legacy and all of that. Mm-hmm. For us, we found that it doesn't really move the needle for our business. Mm-hmm. You know, we, and the work that goes into it is insane. Um, and we yeah. actually prefer to just focus on the existing customers and clients we do have. And we like doing partnerships and little, you know, marketing things here and there, but you know, there's, there was a time when we like went all out on that and we just, you know, it just wasn't what it needed to be for us. Um, Mm -hmm. but I wouldn't say there's anything we regret. I'm glad we went through that. I'm glad we, we definitively know that's how we feel about it. So kind of going back to when you launched in June of 2015, right? That's when you launched build a box Mm -hmm. and it's seven years later can you talk about some of the things that you guys have done to propel your growth over the last seven years? Yeah, build a box box and iterating it and improving it has been at the core of our business. I think we fully have expanded our corporate gifting services. That arm of our business is called Box Box Concierge. It's a seven person team um, and they're handling anywhere from 15 box orders to 15,000 box orders. They're wow. killing it. Um, and so by nature, we've expanded our production, our customization, our packaging, manufacturing, um, and just fulfillment services in general. Like that's just a whole side of our business. Um, I think, you know, we're pretty like, I don't want to say snobby about this, but you know, it's easy to get distracted in the beginning with all these opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. People come to you, they're like, speak at this thing. Um, partner with this person, yes, give these yes. influencers all these free things, you know, and that's for us, we were very much with our blinders on since the beginning. And I think it helps that we kind of went to school in LA and like, we're a little bit like, eh, whatever about that kind of a thing. Yeah. And we're like, I don't know if that's going to move the needle. And we, we've done a good job of not getting too distracted by that. Anybody we do partner with on content or stuff like that is like a very measured, thoughtful decision or a very, um, meaningful relationship to us. Um, I would say like, um, you know, being really selective in, in that co partnership type stuff is, has helped propel in a good way. Um, and then, you know, really just like very thoughtfully investing in, in talent and people to run our different departments has been, you know, an absolute game changer for us. Mm -hmm. I think our senior management level and above is so many wonderful people that we're all, you know, working towards the same goal. Everyone has kind of the same values and that just feels really special. You've obviously been so intentional and really strategic about who you've hired. I assume you've hired some people older than you, some people younger than you. Have you uh, made an effort to let them teach you to let their expertise and their skill sets also inform your own or your leadership? Yeah. Usually like when we bring on a new hire, I, I feel like we're really good about asking, you know, what worked where you were before? Like, tell us about that. Tell us about like how you prefer to be communicated with, how Mm -hmm. you manage up, how you manage down some systems that maybe you thought were really meaningful, some systems that you thought were kind of pointless. We love to learn 
from our hires and hear about what kind of worked. And, you know, we've implemented stuff yeah. that other people have brought to the table. Um, and, you know, it's, it's gone, it's gone really well. I think we're at that really great size too, right now, where a lot of people can kind of bring ideas and we can fully implement them pretty quickly, which is nice. You mentioned that you and your co-founders um, have done a lot of listening to podcasts and read some great books, perhaps on leadership, management, business mm-hmm. building. Anyone stand out particularly in your mind to recommend? The um, negotiation book by the FBI negotiator. I think that was like an amazing um I read that book and watched his masterclass on masterclass because I just feel like, you know, also starting so young, the negotiation side of things that I've had to deal with, I would bring in so many emotions. And after reading that book, I literally approach things with almost no emotion now, which is Mm. really super empowering. Approaching things with no emotion is one of the, I think, um, tricks of like a seasoned entrepreneur. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about how you were able to figure that out? Obviously, books are important. Other ways? I think, you know, in this generation, you are brought up that, you know, boys are good at math and finance, and it's a harder barrier of entry for women to be experts in that. And I think that's just something that's projected onto us. And Mm -hmm. I think that once I realized that, A, a lot of men don't know what the hell they're doing anyway. And B, you know, it's not emotional. It's, yeah, again, data-backed things that you're negotiating and asking for within reason and um, knowing the tactics of how to bring it up and to be, you know, research will always bring confidence. So knowing your stuff will always make you more confident in any of those types of conversations. And like, look, business is personal. I, we own this business when someone quits or, you know, a brand doesn't want to work with us for something, of course I take it personally, like, but I don't project that out into our staff. And, you know, I think that kind of stuff is inevitable. You're human, but, um, with the, the contracts and the, the things like that, it's really just like, nope, this is what we need or it's not worth it to us. Yeah. That's amazing. That, that will serve you well. Going forward and forever. Again, so not perfect, but at least I feel like that's been a big, um, that's a big come up in the last, I would say, two years for at least myself yeah. as an individual. Even if you're not executing on it perfectly, though, at least you know that's sort of what you're striving for. Yeah. Um, and when you're not doing it perfectly, you can sort of like step away from yourself and look back and be like, oh, that's not how I wanted to handle it, which I think in, in and of itself is is a good tool to have. We'd love to know um, where Box Fox is going to be in the next five years, where you see things going. Box Fox is going to be bigger and badder and hopefully more than twice the size. Um, we would love to increase all the different ways we can customize at scale really efficiently, like embossing you know, letters onto leather goods and making it super quick and efficient and easy expanding our manufacturing for sure. And like our own lines is something we're really passionate about. Um, and just, you know, continuing to bring in amazing talent and build our culture and be like, you know, one of the things, how I said, box box is a means for us to pursue, you know, a fulfilled life. One of those is like our philanthropic pursuits and being able to increase how we can get more involved in our communities over time using box box as kind of that vehicle. But yeah, I mean, I'm longevity all the way. Let's just keep going. We're on the up and up here. That sounds bad. Incredible. We are here for that. (laughs) Thank you, Chelsea, so much. This has been a really amazing conversation. We appreciate your time. Thank Thank you you so much. Thank you. Wow. That was an awesome conversation. Such a great conversation. She really has a great handle on risk taking. Yeah. And I think there were so many like key takeaways for me with respect to risk. I think one thing that shows she's really wise beyond her years, I mean, having started a company straight out of college, yeah. like you really are being been successful and being successful. Yeah. yeah. But what it's a testament to is kind of what she was saying about being really methodical with the business's growth. Yeah. Coming from LA where she's in the glitz and the glam of the celebrity and influencer culture, but not letting that really phase or attract too much, like distract them too much, I think was really key. Mm-hmm. They didn't, 
they've tried one sort of big wholesale um, opportunity with a big retailer and decided that ended up not being the right move for them. Mm-hmm. They haven't been, um, you know, sort of seduced by getting some splashy influencer, paying a huge sum to some splashy influencer to get the word out. They've instead taken a really kind of slow and methodical approach, mm-hmm. thereby mitigating risk. Not getting rid of risk entirely, because of course they still have had to do things like sign their own names for a line of credit, which pretty much most every business owner has had to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, she, so for me, it felt like she really has a good handle on risk, and she's not scared of risk. Yeah, because she doesn't go into a situation without having the information. Mm -hmm. and without having communicated really well with the people who are also involved in taking this risk with her. Right. She's not doing anything on her own, which is interesting. You know, like if she's taking a financial risk, opening a line of credit, she's doing it with her other partner. That's also true. And so because they've been really open and honest about what that means to each of them Mm -hmm. and they over communicate and they prioritize that. Yeah. um, it, It always brings that level of like, oh my God, down. That stress and that tension. Exactly. You're not the only one whose name's at the bottom of the contract. That's right. You're coming in, to, you're deciding whether to sign that contract, sign right. that lease, sign that um, line of credit paperwork right. together. Right. So there it, you have that solidarity. Yeah. Um, I imagine if you and I were to have that conversation, if we were ever to yeah. you know, co-sign on a line of credit, mm-hmm. whatever, for example, we would have a conversation about what this means to each of us. Correct. And if something were to go wrong, what it would look like for each of us. And to be super aware of how each other would feel about something like that. Mm -hmm. And that, because we also prioritize over communication. Yeah. Um, And I think that that's the stuff that really can make risk more palatable Mm -hmm. when it's all out there open on the table. I think that feels much better. A hundred percent. Yeah. The last thing I really appreciated about the conversation was um, Chelsea's acknowledgement of doing her best to leave emotions out of the equation when right. she's having tough conversations, negotiations, etc. I think she astutely recognized that at the end of the day, business, especially when you've started yourself, is personal. There yeah. is no getting out of your head with certain aspects of what running a business right. entails. I mean, someone deciding to leave your company, feeling like you've let them down perhaps, or needing to let somebody go, or getting turned down by a potential client, or getting a bad review, what you name it, it does feel personal. But that's gonna happen, and just kind of taking that pause, taking that breath, trying to be a little bit more objective mm-hmm. about the situation mm-hmm. really serves really serves you well. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Thanks again, Chelsea. That was Thank you, Chelsea. Pretty great.